Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Bruce, Nectarina, The Economist, thank you so much for having me here with you today. So this is my first visit to your beautiful island. When I was doing my research to find out about Crete's history, I saw how intertwined it is with the history of Islam. The Ottoman Empire ruled Crete for 253 years, with the majority of Muslims here today being Greek Muslims. Crete played an important part in the Ottomans' strategic command over the Mediterranean and the Aegean seas. What I found particularly interesting is the privileges that Cretans enjoyed under Ottoman rule, such as exemption from the traditional Timar system, avoiding the Ottoman land tenure, and a number of taxes. I was also intrigued to discover that Crete, being known as the cradle of Orthodox Christianity, has such a recognizable landmark as the Janissaries Mosque in Hania itself. This shows the historic relationship between Muslims and Christians, the relationship of coexistence and respect. Crete has also played a significant role in intra-religious dialogue. As in June 2016, we saw Crete hosting the first global Orthodox Council to meet in more than 1,000 years, known as the Holy and Great, the Holy and Great Council. It brought together more than 290 delegates, mostly bishops, representing 10 self-governing local Orthodox churches. I think that for me, the most important aspect of the Great Council meeting is despite the tensions between the two spheres of influence, the Slavic and the Hellenic, the Council upheld the practice of global conciliar conciliarity as that shows the willingness to reach consensus and present a unified body. Practiced since the dawn of civilization, religious tourism is one of the oldest forms of tourism, and yet COVID-19 and the impact of climate change have added a new dimension to the concept of religious tourism. A new program which took place just last year was organized by the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the Halki Summit 4 is the fourth in a series that focuses on ecological awareness and responsibility and shows how seriously the Orthodox Church is taking the environmental issues alongside the impact of COVID-19. COVID-19 is only a reminder to all of us of how insignificant we are in this great puzzle that we call life. And we're definitely ready for a green reset for all humanity. This pandemic has shown us that dramatic measures can be implemented within a short time, time frame and with global efforts leaving little room for excuses to delay significant action on tackling poverty and supporting the vulnerable. Unfortunately, there is no vaccine for climate change. If we have learned one thing from, be, from the COVID-19 pandemic, it's that we are all in this together. So we need solutions for all, not just the privileged few. The pandemic has given us a chance to rethink all our assumptions and reimagine our world. Religious communities have historically been significant innovators and supporting social justice, challenging inequity, and bringing about social change. Religious practice itself is found to have potential advantages from an environmental perspective. Prayer in the context of environmental disasters has been shown to play three important psychological roles. One, helping people persevere and survive distress. Two, providing a sense of protection from future negative events. And three, believing that it can prevent future disasters. All of the major faith em faiths emphasize the importance of charity and working collectively for the common good. They teach us our humanity. They teach us to care for each other, nurture our young, protect our vulnerable. Within religious traditions, relations between humans and other elements of the natural world are not compartmentalized, but instead conceived as being tied into a series of continuous spiritual interactions. This implies a need to conserve and enrich rather than exploit nature. While spirituality is not a panacea to climate change, it is nevertheless an interconnected element. There's no blanket faith-based approach. Rather, we should opt for faith-sensitive approaches. According to Dr. Jamal Sagir, climate change is the biggest threat to world security. 
With the climate crisis, we need to think about the scope and scale of human migration due to climate change and how it will test the limits of national and global governance as well as international cooperation. If we look at the example of Lesbos, we see what can go wrong and need to learn the lessons from this experience, both from the Greek islanders and the Syrian refugees. Today, we're seeing a vastly different approach from European nations towards Ukrainian refugees, who of course are suffering greatly and need our help. They're regarded as brothers and sisters, whereas Muslim refugees from Syria and Afghanistan are treated very differently. As a British Muslim woman working for the last couple of decades in the faith space, it's more and more evident to me that merely having a place at the table is not good enough. I agree with the recent meme that I saw, and that is that we have to become the table. Why is that? It's because unless we navigate the civic spaces properly and turn challenges into opportunities, we'll always be pushing against the tide. I believe that institutions and networks have an enormous part to play in shaping both internal and external norms and cultures. There are many diverse faith communities who are not engaged and are regarded as the other. Unless institutional changes are made, nothing will change. The tourism industry in Greece, as well as the Orthodox Church, can play a critical role in peace building, both from an intercultural, intra-faith, and interfaith perspective. Building walls of ignorance around each other isn't the way. We need to break down the walls and stand shoulder to shoulder by embracing the cultural and religious diversity that exists in the monuments, the buildings, and the artifacts of our countries and promoting religious tourism to show how interconnected we all are. Thank you.